So welcome everybody. I'm Vaughn Welch. I'm the director for IU Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research. And it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you to our second speaker of the 21-22 CACR speaker series. Uh, every year we take one of the speaker series slots and we focus it on one of the many things going on in information security here at Indiana University. And it's my delight today to be focusing on the Research and Education Network Information Sharing and Coordination Center, or REN ISAC, which uh, many folks may know as a national resource, but is also housed right here at Indiana University. It's just many of the, the national impacting information security things we, we do on campus. And uh, before I introduce uh, our speaker, Kim Milford, let me just extend a, a quick and delighted welcome. We have a couple of dignitaries in the audience who are instrumental in the formation of the RAN ISAC. So I just wanna welcome uh, Chancellor McRobbie, who is then VP for IT, was uh, the main force in setting it up. And then uh, former AVP for information security, Mark Bruin. So these were folks who, uh, deserve credit for this great national treasure being here at Indiana University. So with that uh, welcome, I wanna now turn to, uh, to Kim Milford, who serves as the executive director of the REN ISAC. And the REN ISAC is part of a national council of ISACs. And in her role there, she's got the, uh, the role of, of representing research and the higher education space in that national. And she works with that team here at Indiana University to coordinate incident response for global research and education institutes, partners, regional networks, and all sorts, as well as disseminate key information to that. So with that, uh, please join me in welcoming Kim. Thank you so much, Vaughn, and thank you all for tuning in. Let me... Um do the basics of sharing a slide deck. Oh, it's working. I love when technology works for us. Uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit in depth about incident response. Many of you here, I see so many familiar faces and you could have written this deck. You might be nodding in agreement. You might be applauding along. You might be wondering where Kim is coming from on this, um, but hopefully I dropped some new kernels in for thinking about incident response that maybe you aren't thinking about. But You've all contributed to this in so many ways. So thank you for that. I didn't have time to practice, so I might go over, but I talk really fast, so I might go under. Uh, so please bear with me. I'll keep a close eye on the time and I'll make sure we leave enough time for Q&A because I, I wanna hear from you as well. Now let's see if I can advance my slides. Ah, there we go. So just as a real quick uh, itinerary of what we're gonna cover. Uh, the basics, the 101 on incident response, and then diving into some recent incidents and the changing incident response landscape. And those two, those two other ones, I have specific sections on them, but they'll also be threaded into the 101. So you'll see this kind of ongoing development as we move through the slides and the discussion. So we got to start with the basics, right? Let's start with NIST. I'm a big NIST fan. Uh, the four phases, oh, Apparently I'm jumping ahead. The four phases of the NIST incident response life cycle really contains seven stages, right? So we've got preparation. Then the second stage is two, detection and analysis. And the third is three, containment, eradication, recovery, and then post-incident activities. And you see it's cyclical. That's because you don't just finish it and you're done. You keep doing it. Either new incidents pop up, you find gaps in your defense, um, there are new threats that pop up, so it's ongoing. A strong incident response plan is critical to a security program. The REN ISAC in, our, in my service role, the REN ISAC does what we call peer assessment services out to other universities and campuses and colleges and centers where we bring security professionals in higher education networks or, and research networks onto a campus, either virtually or in person, and we assess where they are with their cybersecurity environment. 
So incident response is always a big piece of that. And we have a whole supplemental um, a, a analysis of that for, for schools that want to know more. What we find often is that the incident response plan was written many, many years ago. The first incident response plan usually was in response to a particular incident. And so we find that the plan itself is a bit reactive to that type of incident. It says, you know, where uh, you're, you're always going to do this. Well, you might not always because now we have ransomware and that might change how you handle a denial of service attack or something like that. So, so we find that, that they're always a, a bit reactive and focused. Um, so we're gonna, I'm going to cover some basics, like I said, on incident response. And, and they're generally in an, uh, in an incident response plan. So that's great to see. Uh, but they often need a refresh. They're just old. Maybe their communication me mechanisms are out of date. Maybe they're not, not thinking about social media. So there's always this need for a refresh. Generally, we recommend at least annual testing followed by a review and update of the processes and playbooks. And then I, I always think of incidents as the big ones and the small ones. And, and I got to give credit to my good friend, Mark Bruin here. Um, he would say, when I was running the incident response group at IU, he'd say, you know, if it's a big one and you'd capitalize the B, if it's a big one, I need to know about it. If it's just daily business, I don't need to know about it. So, uh, so I always think of the big one and the small one as, with that in, framing in mind. This talk definitely focuses on the, the larger, more impactful incidents. So the goals of incident response, your goal is to minimize the impact of an incident on organizational missions. That's always going to be the goal. And a couple of thoughts on that. These are sort of my philosophies, I guess you'd call them. <clears throat> you want to nurture a comprehensive mindset. Think broadly in your outreach, in your inclusion, in how you define an incident, in analyzing the impact. It's not just assets. It's not just resources. It's not just victims. It's not your reputation. It's probably all those plus some other things. Uh, adopt a blended threat or all hazards approach. And we can no longer look at incidents as cyber versus physical or disaster versus accident. The impact is how you wanna look at those incidents to, and determine what you're going to do about it. <clears throat> they, incidents now bleed over. There's, there's just continuity between all these different types. Disasters like floods or tornadoes take out networks. So then all of a sudden you have service denial that you need to deal with. Ransomware, we see, we've seen many cases of that this year, ransomware taking out operational technologies like door locks. So it has a physical impact that you wouldn't consider. So we need to approach incident response from that, that impact perspective. During an incident, you want familiarity and certainty uh, and a certain comfort level um, from those involved in response. The more you plan, prep, and test beforehand, the more the involved players will be able to trust the process and rely on everyone taking responsibility for their own action items. If it's a big incident, there is going to be chaos. So it's important to take the chaos, chaos out of what you can control and then, and then following that known, repeatable, comfortable process can also help maintain calmer mindsets because you just know the steps, you trust in them and you go. Another important part of, of preparation is uh, situational awareness. Pay attention to what's in the media and what's on discussion groups of you know, your, your, your trusted sources of news and information. If you were hit by, with a ransomware attack today, would you be surprised? If you are, you're not doing your situational awareness right because we all know that that is a major threat, not just for higher ed, but for all sectors. So we need to think about that. Just like you, you wouldn't be surprised if it was a hurricane or a blizzard. Now, a tornado is a whole different story, right? Hopefully you're watching the weather and you're paying attention to the likelihood of a tornado, but they're so unpredictable. So that's, that's maybe a little different. Another way you can do this, your situational awareness is, is to ask um, questions from your technology leaders and cybersecurity experts about risk and preparedness. So just really try to keep on top of that. Um, communication before, during, and after with victims, with potential victims, uh, with the community and with the public. So again, going back to the first bullet, that, that comprehensive mindset. 
as soon as there, it's clear there's an impact, such as a system outage or a stole or stolen data, start communicating. And there's a big debate of the, about this in the cybersecurity community because we all like to know to analyze the incident and feel a little more prepared for the response of a communication um, before we we put something out. You know, especially if it's public, if if it's broad impact, and you have to put some public notifications out. And I, my views have really changed on this over time. I used to say, no, no, ha you have to have these four things in place. You have to know these four things before you do it. Um, but I, I don't believe that anymore. Um, and, and the reason, so, you know, 20 years ago when I started doing incident response, we found that major incidents had such a reputational hit that it was just better to keep quiet until you knew these things. But today's environment, um, incidents are more commonplace. Uh, and so it's not that big of a deal to say it. And so you might have to say things like, we don't know the full impact. We don't know the full details. We don't really know the source of this. And that's okay too. Uh, so we need to look at it again. Here, I'm gonna say it again uh, from an impact perspective. Think about the victims and the potential victims that they wanna know early, am I included in this? And even if you don't know, let you know let them worry for a little bit of time if you need to until you can tell them yes this is the this is the set of victims versus these people are not victims provide as much information as you can and update it frequently at least daily so that people are aware of it in you know in the places where they're going to find it use social media if you can definitely use the web um, use official announcements things like that so as i said my my thinking on that has changed Everyone is entitled to their own opinion, and uh, I'm sure some of the people here have, have expertise uh, and could lead you in a different direction on that, which is fine. So jumping into the, the steps of incident response. Um, report intake is the initial process, and that provides for reporting and taking in reports uh, about security situations from, um, from someone from someone or more often it's it's automated now uh, where where you believe it requires above and beyond treatment so you know again that big small big versus small incident this requires a step and it requires some of the below steps it requ uh, it requires that the reports be taken and and recorded in some form some tracking system something like that um, and Report intake requires that information is collected and, and analyzed quickly in order to recognize the serious or potential seriousness and enough specifics of the, of the situation so that you can start doing the, the follow-up steps, the expert triage and analysis. The second stage expert triage is, is you need to sufficiently analyze the incident to determine, <clears throat> uh, sorry, to determine if, if it rises to the level of invoking the next formal st step, which you'll see is calling the incident. This analysis is really necessary to ensure that considerable response efforts are confined to only the most serious situations so that you're not doing it on those small incidents. You're only handling it on the big incidents. Most organizations use predefined cr criteria to determine if the reported s situation rises to the need to to go through the formal response process um, and what steps need to be taken. <clears throat> Staff engaged in triage <clears throat> must have a broad working knowledge of the technical environment of the organization and a very good working knowledge of operations that will likely be implicated or have been implicated. Even if not directly implicated, they might be downstream. Such as if you took out your, your you know, uh, active directory, directory, you're going to have a lot of response on, on many systems. Um, it's likely going to be a senior experienced professional doing this expert triage. This person takes the information from the report as, and they, can, they might find subsequent information. Maybe it's changing quickly and they're getting information every 15 minutes. Maybe they're hearing from um, other sources. Maybe the, your incident, I'm sorry, your organization isn't the only one experiencing the incident. And so they need to take all that and make a determination of seriousness. They need to make a recommendation to the person designated to call an incident. That's an authority thing. And it could be them. It could be the same person. It really depends on the organization. 
So then moving on to calling the incidents. Once that cursory evaluation is complete, and, and that's, you're doing evaluation analysis the whole time through every step. So that's just your preliminary, let's get through this and see where we are, what we need to do, how serious it is, what the impact is. So after that's complete, a uh, decision has to be made as to whether you're calling the incident. It's gonna be, be, need to be made by someone who's designated as having that authority in advance. You don't want, uh, you know, I'm not gonna all of a sudden let Vaughn call it for crying out loud, that'd be bad. <laughs> no, Vaughn might, uh, might be the authority to do it, right? Um, so maybe it's Vaughn, but it's not me. Uh, so, so knowing in advance who that is is very important. So you look at the criteria, and then that person, the, the, you have the expert make the the expert who triaged it make the the you know provide a proposal, and then the person with authority calls it. <clears throat> Incident uh, response planning and execution, the response. Scheme has to include a, a we we generally recommend a policy and a plan, and then procedures that support that plan. Because you really have to get into the trees. We have a lot of different types of incidents, and you have to look at all of them and have have playbooks ready. So the incident response policy is about the institution's intent and philosophy, including uh, management commitment. Uh, scope of the policy, to, you know, who is who it applies, are parents included, is the community included, things like that. Uh, specific incident response team authorities and, and your general definition of security incidents. Plus it always, it's always helpful to have some examples if your policies allow that, um, just to give people clarity. Incidents that invoke formal response teams and procedures can vary dramatically between uh, between organizations. Some typically include um, exfiltrating, exposing or disclosing institutional or personal data, altering institutional or personal data, denial of service attacks, disabling or destroying an information or technology asset, gaining unauthorized access to an asset, widespread malware infection, or ransomware coupled with any of those other examples. Another important part of incident response and planning is thinking about the team, the team logistics. Planning should account for contact information for the team. You wanna make sure you have ready access to them and, so, and their support functions. Incident tracking, which I mentioned earlier, reporting mechanisms, communication methods, and productivity. So you want a fully, you, you often want a fully equipped war room. This is, this is changing a little bit, right? As we all work remotely. Um, but still having all the people involved in one place, even if it's just a Zoom room, having that identified in advance is going to help you. Um, but So you want central communication and coordination, incident analysis tools, and, uh, and possibly digital forensics capabilities. Plans and procedures can extend and account for robust information, uh, incident technology analysis. Um, including detailed guidance such as port lists, network diagrams, lists of critical assets, database servers, uh, baselines of expected networks, systems, application activities, and recovery su support where you can get that, you can have that available. Consideration must also be given to the personal issues and comfort of the team. Uh, if, if it is a physical presence, having a break area, having snacks and drinks and other food, maybe even a sleeping area is necessary. And that also goes to the length of time of the incident. A plan should call for procedures related to sharing information with outside parties. How do you manage media interactions? How do you maintain and uh, and, and report status of the incident, um, interacting with law enforcement and other governmental officials that you need to provide information to. Maybe you have upstream or downstream customers, service providers, owners, contractors who are implicated by the incident. So, you know, maintaining that list of contacts is very important. Plans have to provide for a variety of notifications and communications. I talked about this earlier. Um, often people have a like a, a head communicator to help help deal with this. Um, but again, maybe it's multiple people because maybe who's discussing with law enforcement, you want some more technical knowledge there versus who's discussing with the public. So it might be multiple people. It might be a, a, a hierarchical um, organizational plan of who's doing what. 
reports in varying degrees of, of detail might be might be needed by the state, by breach laws, by federal laws, um, obligations related to uh, health, health information, um, even industry standards like um, the payment card industry standards. Plans should account for team to team communications too. How do you expect people to communicate with each other? Uh, you know, we have great instant messaging these days, which is, 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 is wonderfully helpful for this. But if I need to call um, Susan, and she's in a place where her cell phone isn't working, I need to have access to a home phone or another phone. So I need that information too. So just paying attention to all that. Being as detailed and proscriptive as, as, as you can is going to help you. Containment, eradication, and recovery. Containment is about immediately taking steps to ensure that the situation can't escalate, that you don't want it to get worse, and that damage cannot be compounded. There's a continuum of actions that could be taken from severing your network connection or your university connection to the internet um, or other, other, other networks, outside networks, um, to merely changing passwords if it's a breached account. So, you know, it's the, it's the big continuum there. Um, you could maybe bolster firewall rules um, for the time to filter or block certain things from happening. All situations will never be accounted for in your incident response plan, but your plan should outline basic criteria for choosing how to react to an incident that has affected systems and operations and whether you're going to, to move past significant um, investigation right into recovery, right into that, that containment. Is that phase number one, number two, number three? So that's very dependent on the type of incident you see. And then along with that is, is how are you gonna spend your resources? Well, how are you gonna prioritize it and spend your resources? The initial decision around containment and eradication has to be about impact on staff resources. Uh, what's the value to complete that step, to complete the analysis and determine the next steps or do you just cut and run? If a decision is taken to recover and reestablish services immediately, Plans have to account for identifying all affected hosts. You need to restore operating systems, applications, and data from clean and trusted media and apply available patches and networks. Passwords for any breached user or administrator accounts can't be reused, so you need to have those reset. Additional protections for these systems and data should also be considered. They've been targeted, they've been impacted, and they may be targeted again. If the decision is taken to research and investigate further, so more analysis before moving forward with, um, with containment or eradication, uh, a, a robust forensics capability is needed as part of that, either, either trained existing staff or through advanced contracts with forensic service providers. In general, I recommend using uh, forensics providers. There's so much expertise in it now that, that they tend to bring that to the table. And, and your internal folks might be, there might be high anxiety as they're dealing with this incident, or they might be focused on containment. So it allows you to get two things going at once. Of course, that, that usually means more funding. So that's an, a, 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 something you have to account for as well. Um, so that's generally my rec recommendation. Evan, if there is gonna be law, a law enforcement case, so you need to think about forensics. You can't just skip that step. Uh, evidence gathering and handling has to include a host of information in the right order and in the right place, um, location, serial numbers, model numbers, host name, uh, MAC addresses, things like that, uh, as, you know, as well as details like names, titles, phone numbers. So you really have to have that information. Um, again, going back to incident uh, tracking, if you have a tracking system, you can keep it in there um, or somewhere else where you can keep detailed notes about the incident. So that's very important if you're moving forward with an investigation. There are, and there are legal, uh, legal procedures like chain of command, chain of custody that you need to consider too. Plans uh, have to account for recovery actions such as restoring your systems from clean backups replacing compromised files with clean visions, installing patches, changing passwords, tightening network perimeter security, restoring systems to normal operations, confirming that the system is, is working as, as normal, 
um, remediating vulnerabilities, if there are any existing vulnerabilities, improving and enhancing system logging and networking, um, and establishing a high level of vigilance and communicating that out to the community. Post incident activities are designed to gain knowledge and improve processes. Follow-up plans should account for analyzing incident response performance, summarizing exactly what happened and, uh, and, uh, and when, assessing staff and management performance, assessing uh, the effectiveness of the documentation and procedures, uh, looking at the information collected and shared and how helpful it was, do, do things need to be tuned to make it more helpful if there's a, a future incident like that, determining if there are new and improved indicators and detection measures, um, looking at analysis and mitigation, looking for preventative and correction actions that might be taken, and leveraging uh, collected it, in, incident data to continue that improvement. Remember, it was the life cycle, so you look at it continuously. In today's massive integrated technology world, <clears throat> many security professionals recommend using an observe, orient, decide, and act approach as pictured here. It's essentially the same as the NIST life cycle and the steps described in the previous slides with an emphasis on triage and analysis and a focus on integration and quick response. And then you repeat it as necessary. So it's very iterative on purpose. A traditional, the traditional approach heavily based on technology controls can, can create a flood of alerts um, that require further analysis, extensive time spent on escalating and routing and uh, limiting your time for mitigation. The o OODA approach relies on strong observation, orientation and decisions prior to action. So you really focus on that part of the cycle um, and that iter iterative process. Incident response focused cybersecurity professionals tend to think of all these steps by the general type of incident. <clears throat> they draft and use playbooks according to the type and severity of the incident. The Incident Response Consortium has many playbooks available uh, based on the NIST incident response cycle that we saw earlier. And I've, uh, I have a reference for them at the end. This is just their general page for all the different uh, playbooks that they have. It's a great resource. This is their playbook, and I know it's probably an eye chart for you. This is their playbook for um, phishing detection. So it's just an example of some of the information you can get and apply. And maybe you already have your own playbook, um, but you can always compare it to theirs and, and get some good ideas from theirs. I'm going to spend quite a bit of time talking about detection. This is a really important part of incident response. First of all, uh, you know, got to throw some acronyms around, right? It's not a technology speak with speech without some acronyms. Medium time to detect and medium time, mean, I'm sorry, mean time to detect and mean time to respond. These are critically important. It still takes most often days, weeks, and even months for an, in, for an organization to find out they had an incident. Oftentimes, it comes from external sources, either C-certs, law enforcement agencies, maybe your um, managed security uh, uh, providers, um, your automated threat provider. So you might be hearing this about and seeing the activity from external. It might be a manual report versus uh, a, an automated report. So really looking at your, me your mean time to detection and response and trying to have a goal of narrowing that down. Is it hours, is it minutes versus days, months, and longer? That's really important. It's critical uh, for an organization to have the ability in, in terms of tools and staff capabilities to recognize incidents quickly. And that might be through you know, some of these ideas listed here, but also um, using centralized logging with log analyzers, let your automation work for you when it comes to logs because there's just too much data for a person to pour through anything. Um, th definitely analysis, expert review is a necessary part of that. So you wanna really trim and tune the data so that they, can, they know where to focus and they can really look for um, the, the anomalies, the suspicious things. Intru uh, using intrusion detection and intrusion prevention systems is a great way to get information. 
um, both network-based and host-based, and you want visibility at the borders in your data centers between buildings and to cloud providers now is another important piece of it. So you use those to analyze the risk and, deter and then from there you want to determine where, what, what is your optim optimal uh, sensor numbers and placement? Where do you want your, your sensors placed? You might have to consider resources. Maybe you can't afford all the sensors you want. So where are your top four? Um, and the same with people. You might not have people to, pay, to analyze as much. So, you know, you might have to scale that back if needed too. So, so always use your priorities and your, your risk analysis. Uh, you can use malicious code detection, such as antivirus or endpoint protection. Um, email protection is a great source of information, of, of protection, and also the logs tell you a lot. So bring, bringing that into your, into your centralized logging is going to be helpful. Um, using a, a security event platform to analyze and correlate events will help. Again, this is a let automation work for you moment. Um, and with that, you, you can really pay attention to alert fatigue and fine tune things to reduce fatigue or just to change things because it's easy. If you're seeing the same thing every day, I always use the beginning of the, the Matrix movies where they've got the numbers coming down in green and it doesn't make any sense. Then all of a sudden you see words start appearing out of it. So that's a good thing, right? When you see the words start appearing, you know you're tuned in. But if you look at it enough, you might quit seeing them. So, so fine tuning those alerts so that you notice changes and you notice suspicious activity is key. You might also use a, 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 a security vendor for this. Um, there are many, many managed security service products that, that might meet your needs. Um, don't, underestimate, don't underestimate manual processes, getting reports from people. Oh, I, I usually do it this way and it just didn't work. It might sound like just a user error on its face, but there could be some validity to a real suspicious event on their device. And reports from other organizations and communities, that goes back to the situ situational awareness I talked about before. Pay attention to what's going on. So looking at detection a bit more, focusing on things you can look at, some examples of what you can see before that show um, oddities or suspicious activities, and then footprints that you might see after a, a, an incident that you can start paying attention to, looking for, using your automation. So uh, for instance, you know, you see a host records an audited configuration change in its log. You can set an alert to find that automatically. So you don't need people, people don't need to look for that. You can use automation to look for it. So that's really uh, some, some good examples here. Behavioral analysis is key. Blocking external indicators of compromise that might be provided to you from your threat intelligence service is still absolutely necessary, but it only tells part of the story. The adversaries know we use ind indicators of compromise. We key on them and we filter and, de and detect for them. And they know that. So they change their URLs and uh, source sites frequently, sometimes every minute. <clears throat> Insider behavioral information is, is a reliable, supp is reliable supplemental information that can help you pinpoint incidents. Automation is your friend here too for sussing out incidents based on behavior. You don't have to think about that. Let your automation think about that. Uh, Ren Isaac's technical director, Kristen Stevens and I were chatting the other day about incident response. I'm not sure if she's here. Um, she might be, but she told me recently about a cook quote from Sergio Caltaldroni, um, the vice president for threat intel at Dragos. And I'm gonna paraphrase it here. While prevention is still an important piece of incident response, more focus is needed to be placed on faster detection and containment. Adversaries are always going to find a way around defenses. And this, this really bothered the heart of a protector, the heart of a solutions-oriented protector's soul. You know, I'm like, no, that can't be true. They're going to happen anyway. Um, so I brought it up to a group of cybersecurity professionals in the Indi Indiana area earlier today for, for perspective. And they subscribe to a philosophy similar to, similar, similar to what is uh, he pictured here, um, with credit to Anthem CISO Dustin Wilcox on that. Um, and it's an overlapping, multi-pronged approach to detection and, and prevention with the underlying theme 
of understanding your risks and your threats. They all agree that, that incidents are inevitable, and, but it's still placing great importance on prevention. So it's not either or, it's both. Oh, what's going on? So now we're gonna jump into a little bit of incidents in the US uh, research and education sector. Um, this, is, this, this is quarter two data, and this is data from the REN ISAC. <laughs> we receive automated threat reports from information sharing partners daily. If reports show indicators of compromise at any US-based .edu, we forward that information we receive about the incident to our contacts at that, that uh, university, college, um, you know, uh, conferrer of a higher education degree. Uh, we'll also send it to global r and &E institution contacts if we have their contact information. Um, so we, we look at relevant date and time, IP addresses, credentials, malware signature. We send that to the incident response contacts at that institution so that they can take action on it. And the incidents listed here are a compilation of the notifications sent out by the REN ISAC. So compromised computers, the next slide is about that more in detail. Um, you can see that uh, quarter two was a little bit higher than, than quarter one. I think that some of that is probably because of the return to campus. We've all been at home, which doesn't mean it's not happening, that devices aren't being compromised, but we didn't see it perhaps because it was going through ISPs. So it was coming through commercial uh, networks more so than, than research and education networks. So that's probably one reason. Um, compromised credentials is is very dependent on what's going on in, in the wide, you know, in the internet at large. Has somebody reported a breach of their credentials? And if so, if so, we take that breach, we parse it out, and we send it to the institutions, in the .edu institutions, so that they can take action on their credentials. Uh, any one report, so we, we, we made 7,600 reports in quarter two, one report could contain as many as multi-thousand um, credentials. So it's not just a one-to-one -one match. It's, it, it contains you know, up to millions. Um, so uh, compromised credentials also were up for the second quarter. I don't, it, I don't really know of any incidents in particular. A lot of times we see the big incidents in the press, so we can, we can correlate that. But in this case, uh, there, there weren't any that are coming to my mind, but maybe you know of a few. Um, we, we look for spam and fish and vulnerable computers. Uh, that's things that we're getting more and more reports on from our members and our partners and able to report out. And then open recursive domain resolvers and open mail relays. It's, there's just an always a steady cadence of activity in those areas. And those allow threats to be passed along. So we wanna close those up as much as we can. Um, as I, I think I went through most of this. I forgot I had it on the slide, so you guys got that. Um, uh, the last one is, is sort of important. <clears throat> Higher educational credentials are very valuable to, to uh, thieves or anyone. Uh, it gives access to journals and university license discounts. There's a prestige connection for social engineering and business email compromise, and they're used for identity theft. So we often see them on the dark web, or on weird, suspicious markets where they're for sale for some low amount. Uh, I think last time I checked, it was between five and seven dollars and fifty cents per identity. Um, health records are actually going for higher right now. I, uh, I don't know how they're valuable, but I don't think like a criminal. So you know, maybe you guys have already thought that out. Um, incidents in the U.S. Slide two. Here's a breakdown of the types of malware that we, were, we sent notifications on to, to universities and colleges. Uh, Andromeda was a big, uh, was the clear winner in Q2, over double what the other um, types we're seeing. This is our top 10. Um, and then I tried to say type, although there's a lot of overlap between botnet and C2 and Trojan and Worm, um, but I tried to give you some idea there. And then, you know, to me, what's compelling is the year these, these vulnerabilities were, the vulnerabilities were discovered. We report on exploits, not vulnerabilities. So that's, you know, there's, there's a difference between the, the vulnerability and the exploit. <clears throat> uh, but if you look at 
Gozi and where's the other one? And Config are 2007, 2008. Why is it that these aren't patched? This goes back to that time to, de to detection that I was talking about earlier, MTDTD, where we need to look for these, suss them out, and close this open, opening for exploit more, much more quickly than we are now. So we sent 328 notifications about Gozi, which was created in, or, 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 or first, I should say, first exploited in 2007. We can do better than that. I don't know how we get there, but uh, I'd love to hear of a, uh, your ideas for a research project on that so that we can really shorten that, that window of, of, of vulnerability. Some recent threat trends, uh, and everyone knows about all these, right? Because you, there's, there's nothing we haven't said about them. Um, but let's talk about 30, third party attacks. And the first one I list there, Kaseya, at the heart of that, that was a ransomware attack too by the Revil ransomware group. Uh, their names are really important to them. So I always try to drop that so they can go, woohoo, we won. Um, we find that the lone wolf cyber attackers are now eclipsed by threat actors operating at industrial skill. Um, some groups like Revil are, are, are financially motivated. I don't think there's any surprise there. Um, and we see that there's, you know, the, the, there's, there's three phases. There's the creator, the middleman, and then the, the perpetrator. And they all work at different levels. And they work together. It's a cohesive model. So it's really kind of scary how organized they are. We can probably take some lessons from them on the defense side. Um, the Kaseya VSA, which was what was used, is widely installed at over 1 million customers. So it presented a very large opportunity for attack. Um, and it really inscore, uh, underscores the, the, the risks of the software supply chain. Software vul vulnerability exploits lie at the heart of Kaseya, SolarWinds, Hafnium, Excelion. So we're seeing, SolarWinds was probably the first big one, but now we're seeing all these copycat attacks. And frankly, I don't even want to say they're just copyright attacks because some of them are, were years in the making. So they started years and years ago before there was any public face to them. So they're not necessarily copy, uh, copycat attacks. Um, in April of 2021, NIST published recommendations on defending against software supply chain attacks. I'll have that link later for you. Uh, there's also uh, the, the latest um, <laughs> the latest joint uh, FBI CISA advisory is on the Conti ransomware. And again, that'll be, be posted. And I put phishing up here. I could, phishing is still the most common initial attack vector. So, you know, looking at that, thinking about that, responding to that, that's one, that's something that has to be ongoing, constant, and can't be handled by your technology team. It needs to be something that's that's enforced, not enforced, um, provided to end users and that they're educated on and aware of constantly. These are some of the 2021 threats impacting research and education. I'll make these slides available so you have the link because my, my browser likes to turn the links, the, the ugly links into pretty little phrases for you. So I'll make these available. Um, I want to talk really briefly about incident response in the cloud, in addition to the third party attacks that I described above, which is a big piece of this too. It's very difficult to acquire your traditional data sets for incident response when you don't have the data, when it's in the cloud, such as full disk images. You're not going to get that. Uh, and then if it's a, a cloud provider that provides significant Significant, provides two significant customers or clients um, that's impacted, they, you have to look at the full scale and the of potential incidents. It's not just you, it's much broader than just you. So they're having to parse through all that information and provide it out to you. It might slow things down. They might not be sharing information as, as quickly as you would like. Um, <clears throat> and then the contractual language helps. Your contract with that vendor is going to help you. But again, in a large scale incident, they might decide they need to handle all customers similarly, but they can't read your contract and go, oh, okay, with this, with this university, we're gonna do it this way. And with this business, we're gonna do it this way. So they might decide, nope, we're doing everyone the same and we'll deal with the aftermath in legal cases after the fact. So 
I've been calling COVID the longest incident recently. In many ways, it's, it's, it is absolutely an incident. And it's just been so long that we forget to think of it as an incident. I doubt if anyone's doing incident tracking on all the changes from COVID, right? It's, so it's the longest incident. It's also a blended threat. It's a physical threat, the pandemic, that greatly impacted how we use and deal with technology. Now, it was also exacerbated by new threats created around COVID. So we've got this nice nested incident. Um, the, the, the new threats exploited staff working remotely, exploited remote access, and commonly used technologies such as Zoom and VPN that allowed us all to work from the safety of our homes. COVID also took its toll on mental health, um, increasing uncertainty and anxiety for all of our workers. IT and cybersecurity professionals were at the heart of that. Often uh, they needed to react and respond to incidents, outages, as well as the uncertainty. And we were front and center oftentimes in helping provide information about COVID because we were, we were the incident response people. So we wanted to provide information out to our communities, whether that was the university community or the community at large, um, <clears throat> while dealing with the incident internally. And all that in the face of budget cuts and staff shortages throughout COVID. Um, there are great ways to boost morale and help staff maintain uh, the appropriate work-life balance. A couple examples of there is enhancing communications in your frequency and transparency. Uh, that really allows engagement and it, it provides an important sense of community to staff. Um, providing flexible work hours and scheduling to allow for act adaptability, dealing with family issues and health, and personal needs and time. And I said, you know, I'm separating those things, personal needs is your, your appointment with your doctor. Personal time is you just need some downtime. We all do. So acknowledging that and allowing that is helpful. And then shifting the, the, the thinking from threat, anxiety to opportunity. We saw this a lot at the beginning of COVID and throughout COVID. We went to Zoom so quickly and effectively. And many, many institutions had to, um, had to deploy multi-factor authentication, and they did that very well and quickly and responsively. So that shifting from, from threat to opportunity is a great way to show leadership in this area. In general, over half of cybersecurity professionals say they're kept up at night by stress of the job and work challenges. This is in a survey from the Chartered Institute of Information Security. I'll provide that reference in a minute. Um, and then many said that the pandemic made security reviews, audits, and overseeing processes much more difficult. Two-thirds agreed that uh, forced cancellation of education events, training, and sessions um, widened their skills gaps. They felt like they were less able to deal with all these new challenges. Um, so it's, it's tough work, and we need to be aware of burnout and do what we can to help with that. That's kind of, that's kind of a terrible way to end things. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just, it's acknowledging a truism, right? That we know this is existing, so how, what can we do to help it? Here are a couple of the references. As I said, uh, the, I'll, I'll provide the slides so you can jump into these if you want to more. And with that, I am done with my formal presentation. Um, I'm happy to answer questions, although I might also, I reserve the right to say, oh, you know who really has the best answer for that? my good friend, Tim Goth, or my good friend, Mark Bruin. So you might get called on as well as, uh, you might ask questions, and you might, might also answer questions. Well, thank you very much, Kim, for that talk. Um, if folks have questions, I'll ask you to either raise your, your Zoom hand, so to speak, or feel free to type it in the chat, and I can relay it. And Kim, maybe why I give people a, a moment to articulate those, let me ask you about um, your thoughts on, you know, we've seen the state of Indiana has now passed the mandatory cyber incident reporting, 1169, and we're seeing a slew of legislative bills at the federal level. I, I'm curious to, to hear your thoughts on these mandatory reporting and, you know, if you think they help or hinder. It's so funny because I had a slide on, in, on that and I took it out. <clears throat> I think they have the capacity to do, do both. They, uh, I love that people, that, that the governments wanna help out. 
the state of Indiana and the federal government want to help out, and they see this as a way of helping. I love the idea of a central clearinghouse for incidents, right? Beyond that, I'm a little nervous about both the Indiana law and the federal bills. Um, they, they don't define incident very clearly. I, I don't like the penalties for, like they're talking about fining you if you don't report, that seems wrong to fine a victim. The, the, these, the, these, the institutions, the organizations that have to report this, they're not the perpetrators. They're victims and asking them to pay money because they didn't send the report in time um, seems like we're just adding insult to injury on them. So I don't like that. Um, the, the federal bills don't don't incorporate the role of the ISACs at all, which, you know, we've got 20 plus years in some cases of successful information sharing and analysis around cyber events that aren't aren't inc incorporated in the laws. And we've met with some of the, the Congress, uh, some of Congress, some of the Congress representatives and senators. Sorry, I was stumbling over that. Um, and they go, yeah, that's nice, but it's not helping. And so they've seen it as 20 years of, of failure, whereas we see it as 20 years of success in information sharing. Um, so there's 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 not an ongoing use of everything that we've developed or ways to leverage that information sharing. I'm very worried that they won't share back. They have the best intentions of sharing back, but there's going to be so much data and they're going to be so heads down that they're not going to share back to victims or the community. So there are a lot of flaws with it. Uh, we're trying to, the National Council of ISACs is trying to help Congress understand these um, these issues and deal with them up front. There's a lot of promise too. So good question. Thanks, Vaughn. Yeah, and thank you, Kim. And we've got a, a question from Andrew English. Um, you know, as we prep for incident response detection shifts with multi-cloud organizations, so I think he's talking about situations, you know, we have Google and Azure and, and AWS perhaps. Uh, how do you think this added perimeter will uh, cause different challenges for defensive teams? Uh, so again, our access to information is, is changed in a cloud environment and multi-cloud just makes that, just adds to the complexity. Um, you know, it used to be that I'd say, get to know, and I still say this, get to know your law enforcement people. Don't be, don't let it be that the first time you meet your local FBI agent, don't let that be after an incident, get to know them. So I wonder if we need to do, and this is me just guessing, uh, because we don't really know yet. Uh, do we need to get to know our, our cloud incident response team people in the same fashion? Does it make sense to reach out to them? Hopefully you're doing some security analysis of that cloud vendor up front. Maybe you can get their incident response uh, contact information. And you call them going, hey, how are we going to deal? How are you dealing with this? How are we going to deal with it collectively? We saw a little bit of that happen with um, solar winds that they started reaching out to impacted uh, sectors. No, I'm sorry, it wasn't. It was Blackbaud. I'm getting my incidents confused. Um, and, and they reached out to higher ed because we are a big use, a big sector that uses their their services. So um, we saw them be very proactive about that early in the uh, early in the incident. And then after the incident, not before the incident. So are there ways we can develop those relationships to have that flow of information up front? Is it through the ISACs, perhaps? Yeah, and Kim, I saw a uh, comment here from Mark Bruin, which is the initial protest to be the right wording in contracts. So. Well, well, very good. Maybe why uh, just give folks a few more seconds here to see if the last question emerges. Let me, as usual, thank uh, Diana Simmer and uh, Joe Tumain, who do the, the organization of the speaker series and lining everything up. So thank you both to Diana and Joe. And, and Kim, let me give you a big thank you for, for coming today and presenting. Uh, and uh, hopefully it spur some connections amongst the Indiana University community here. And uh, Joe, let me pass it to you to, uh, to tell folks about what's coming next and, and wrap us up here today. Thank you, Vaughn. And, and Kim, that was a really wonderful talk. I just wanna make one comment before we close off here. Uh, I come from the law school and I was a, a former practicing lawyer, particularly with media law. And there were some organizations uh, that were called media bench bar forums where you would bring together uh, judges, the chief of police, the chief of the fire department, media lawyers, 
in these informal settings in order to try to talk through the different perspectives that, that come to play so that when actual controversies arise between these disparate groups, you have relationships. And so I think your idea of building out with law enforcement and cloud services outside of the context of an incident is a really wonderful one. Um, I also wanna say that as a person uh, from the law background to see someone who has an accounting degree and a law degree and doing what you're doing, it really gives us great pleasure to have you be a part of this and uh, help me talk to other law students about potential careers outside of your traditional legal path. So thank you, Kim. Sure, thank you. And then the, the final thing I'll, I'll say is that our next talk is on October 21st with Dr. Russell Buchan. He is a senior lecturer in law at the University of Sheffield School of Law. The title of his talk is Live and Let Spy? Question mark, Cyber Espionage and International Relations and International Law. So once again, thank you so much, Kim, and thank you for all coming. We hope to see you on October 21st at noon. Have a wonderful day. Bye, everyone. Thank you.